<laughs> so today, so today we're very fortunate to have Dr. Tashi Dawa, who is a Tibetan medical practitioner, and he's going to speak to us today about um, botanical medicines um, in his practice and in kind of traditional Tibetan medicine. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so actually, last time when I was given this topic, like ethnobotany in Swarikwa, so. I thought, why not I give a brief outline of what Tibetan medicine is initially? Because when you don't have the outline or the brief, brief idea about what Tibetan medicine is, then going through the main therapeutic, therapeutic part of the medicine is like, again, just getting nothing from what Tibetan medicine is. So that's why last time I wrote to Kasindra about this also. So uh, legacy of Tibetan medicine, I just wanted to know yeah, it's fine, I think. Yeah. So, how many of you have heard about what Tibetan medicine is? Any idea? Red article, okay. That's great. But, uh, okay, let me just uh, give you what, uh, first Tibet, I think you might be aware of what Tibet is like. <laughs> so. This is like, I mean, nine, before 1959, this is the actual area that uh, was under the uh, Tibet. And this square, not the dotted ones, this square is what now Chinese government is claiming to be the TAR or Tibet Autonomous Region. So you can see that uh, Tibet by geographically, it's a landlocked country. So even though uh, Dal Lada, Spiti, Kino, in Nepal, Thalpu, and all these areas are also like more or less like a Tibetan previously, like before 1959. And here you can see Sikkim, Thimpu, and Bhutan. It's uh, more or less like Tibetan. And then Tawang is here. So we have a herbal garden uh, in this area, which is like more or less like 13 kilometers from Tibet, which is funded by Indian government. And uh, most of the plants that uh, we are talking about is into the Trans Himalayan Belt because I've never been to Tibet and I don't know <laughs> about that re in real reality. But uh, the plants that we find, especially in the Trans Himalayan Belt and some of the tropical plants uh, that is uh, used in Tibetan medicine. So, historically, and I've put up this because this is the stable food. You know about this wheat and barley. <laughs> And in Tibet, Tibetan culture also, we, this, we consider this as an auspicious thing. In every ceremonial thing, we just offer kind of a thing like this. And before Buddhist, Buddhism disseminated into Tibet, there's another indigenous religion called as Bon. So you might have heard about this Tholpo, Thugu, and all those civilizations. So. Uh, I personally used to, I mean, trace back this tradition to Inca civilization, Maya civilization. So there's a lot many, I mean, things quite similar to this, I mean, the Bon tradition, because it involves a lot many shamanism and then clothing patterns, because they don't have the script and uh, they just worship the elements and all that. But they do have some kind of a tradition like speaking to some mediums. Gods, spirits, and all those things are uh, much uh, uh, in this uh, pre Buddhist era. And nowadays you can find this same religion born. But uh, they do have now uh, entire like philosophy thing, concept, everything is there. So even uh, in the recent, I mean, like uh, one of the Chinese archaeological, archaeologists, he has found out that the Tibetans have like uh, survived in Tibet more than 30,000 years. And uh, Bon, they claim that it is more than like 15,000 Bon tradition. And in the seventh century, it's more or less this period that uh, the Buddhism disseminated into Tibetan territory during this period. So it's more or less like a golden era for the Tibetica. The Tibetica in the sense, the development in the whole literature uh, the tradition, the culture, everything started in the 7th century. So what happened during this time is like the integration of 
various systems of, especially in the medical field, Tibetan medicine. Uh, when I'm using this TM, it's more or less like Tibetan medicine, not traditional medicine. <laughs> okay. okay, Tibetan medicine, I, I'm using this. And uh, after 7th century, you can see that there are a lot many different medical schools and lineages coming up, treasure tradition lineage. So treasure tradition lineage is again a very important I mean, kind of a tradition uh, where you have like 18 different kinds of tradition, uh, treasures. So treasures may be very coded things like formula in modern terms, E is equal to mc square, which can be proved into I mean, like various things. You can derive a lot of things from that thing, small e to e is equal to mc square, right? But from some scrolls, you can find like whole volumes of books. So there's a whole lot of I mean, medical texts coming from this tradition also. So during this seventh century, this concept actually came up. I mean, like concept of integrated medicine. Because seventh, during seventh century, we used to claim that there's the first international conference on medicine. So there's a whole lot of, I mean, like physicians coming from Greco Arabic uh, part, Rome, Afghanistan, all those sites, you know, neighboring countries, and especially in, from Nepal also, China, India, all these things, I mean, came up. And what they did was they <clears throat> came up with this book, I mean, with contributing their own traditions or systems. So combining best of the prevailing medical system in the best interest of humanity. Because at the time, king was the supreme power and he decides all the things. So what he did was, we need the best of the uh, systems for the best of the humanity. This is what he, he said, and there is a whole lot of, I mean, quotes and uh, laws for the people to abide by regarding the Tibetan medical system or itself, right? Holistic manner as no single system can meet all needs. This is what the actual concept was. So during those times, I mean, the various systems that came into Tibet was like Grigo Arab system, Indian system, Trom. So at the time, Tibetan used to call Rome as Trom, Krom, Krom sometimes, yeah. So Krom system, Chinese system, Kashmir at the time was like an independent territory. Apart from when, when I'm saying Indian, it's more or less like the central part of what uh, today's India is, like UP and Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, all these comes in Indian system, okay? And then we can also see that Nepal system, Trugu system, Tholpo system, Khotan, Minyak, Horror, Mongolian system also. The, those are more or less like a tribal area, but still then, they might have some kind of experiences, knowledges about some of the healings. So all those were actually incorporated into the Tibetan medical system. Sorry. And afterwards, I mean, you can also see these different schools of medicines uh, continuing in Tibet, like Pon Medical School, Yutok Lineage School, Trangti Lineage, Chang Lineage Sur, Techo School, Treasure School. So Treasure School is very important because what they do is, for instance, even nowadays also, there are many people who can decipher many uh, coded languages. So this can be inscribed on a stone, maybe, sometimes within a stone, sometimes they have kind of a, a clairvoyance. And within such a time, they spend like six, seven days nonstop writing. Sometimes those people are illiterate also. They can speak uh, like nonstop. There are a lot many in Tibet right now. So Chakpuri school, then Minsikan, and almost in all the monasteries, because in those days, monasteries or temples are more or less like an uh, area where people have a more academic things. So in monasteries, you have to learn like all the sciences, not only the philosophical part, medicine, astrology, then other technology, I mean like art and architectures, paintings, and then poetry, literatures, everything is studied in monasteries. So. So far, like, I mean, there are more than 6,000 being destroyed, but now we can just estimate that there are like 
6,000 different medical schools in those areas, small, small areas. And there are some family lineage schools. Family lineage school in the sense, they have their own, I mean, like specific, unique kind of a formulation, preparation for certain disease specific thing. Sometimes, I mean, if you have kind of a liver cirrhosis, then they will tell you that this family has this medicine. Go for that. So they specialize in certain things. Some of the families, they specialize in herbal metallic things like use of mercury, sulfite, like that. Some of those very specialized in mineral usage. So this is just a, a brief outline of what the historical uh, uh, part of the Tibetan medicine is. So when I, when I say like integration of those concepts of different system, it means that being together, because even though like uh, it's more or less like a very displaced kind of a territory in Tibet, uh, very huge territory, but less number of people, but still then I mean, they work together. Even they are like uh, different school of thoughts, but uh, when the medicine comes in, then it's more or less like integrating two different schools of philosophy or something like that. For instance, like Bon and Buddhism are two different religions. But when it comes with the medicine, it's like a bridge. Even the astrology also. So communicating with each other, understanding each other, reaching agreements, because everything has to do with the humanity. So this is what it is. And respecting each other, working with each other, all these were the entire I mean, concept behind what integrated medicine was like. So, oh sorry, uh, what is Tibetan medicine or Sovarikpa? Because the actual word in Tibetan is like Sovarikpa. Uh, I've just used that. And in this system what we deal is like what is health, what is disease. So when I use this word like this is, sometimes people take this disease as like an entity, kind of anti different entity. So I used to use this word because it's like an antonym of is, is what is is, right? And what is medicine? All these are actually the uh, concept even dealt in the modern medicine also. So sova rikpa. Sova means to heal or healing. Act of healing, action. Rikpa means science or the knowledge itself. So sova, it involves four different faults or four different points. Like what is the object to be healed? Object to be healed is the body, ultimately. Body itself or the disease itself, right? <clears throat> so the healing agent. What healing agent that we use is diet, lifestyle, medication, surgery. So diet may be like food and beverages, lifestyle, depending on the seasonal thing. And it has to do with sometimes astrological calculations, almanac, winter solstice, summer solstice, and equinox. All those things comes into the lifestyle. Medications, so they are like use of minerals, metals, stones, then organic products, and then plants, medications. So in the surgical part, it's more or less like an invasive thing. So uh, in the fifth century, we can trace that one of the king, his prince actually born with the congenital, he was like a blind when he was born. But later, I mean like his, uh, uh, this thing, blindness was removed using some golden spoon, I mean, golden spoon in the sense, it's like more or less like an instrument which is made up of gold. So use of those things, because Tibetans have this idea that gold is very receptive to our body. And during the time, they, they also have the idea of what infection is, because this same king, he suffered from leprosy later and what he did was he just went into the it's more or less like a mummification of self mummification even though he was not dead he just went into this thing uh, the, uh, uh, that is more or less like a born tradition so 
uh, he just I mean like uh, it's like a homicide kind of thing because he does he don't want to I mean infect other people this is what I mean because they have this concept that when you get into get in contact with this disease leprosy then this will I mean like infect other people this this, this will communicate things like that and the treatment strategy third is the SOA this word SOA involves the third portion is treatment strategy in the sense how to diagnose disease disease pathogenesis disease, disease etiology then uh, pathology itself in, involves a lot many things like signs and symptoms sim, uh, reading signs and symptoms and then pulse diagnosis urine diagnosis looking at the face the way they speak gait everything I mean, like those are involved in this treatment strategy and strategy in the sense I mean once you know the disease patholo uh, pathology then you also has to I mean know about the prognosis what would be the destiny of this disease so depending on that the treatment procedure is I mean like planned and fourth one is the physician as the healer so in this it is dealt with the ethics of what medi medical practitioner should be so for instance uh, in the modern schools you take uh, this Hippocrates oath once in a life on a convocation day or something like that but in our case every day when I wake when we wake up we have to take this oath pledge so this is the difference because just for the degree you are just taking oath but here it's, it has to deal with the life of a person so every day you have to I mean like furnish your own motivation all these things so that's why be uh, the person is uh, a pharmacologist department pharmacologist cultivator anything he has to take oath I mean oath in the sense do some prayer inspiration all these things so that I mean with good motivation there are certain ways which will help the patient so when we talk about this so it's more or less like health versus disease so in modern terms it's more or less like a homeostasis of the uh, bodily fluids or something like that maybe they might talk more about the psychological things and then the physical body but here we talk about CPE I mean cosmophysical elements so when we talk about like uh, most of the traditional medicines when we talk about element it doesn't necessarily have to do with the elements that the modern chemistry says about or views like hydrogen helium all these are elements but in our case it's element means so just to avoid this misconception I'm using CPE cosmophysical element because from the macrocosm from the birth of a universe to the birth of a human or any beings it has to do with these five cosmophysical element at the microscopic level maybe at the cellular level even at like uh, nanoparticles we also talk about these five cosmophysical elements and uh, homeostasis in the sense the balanced state of these different planes like mental plane spiritual plane emotional physical plane if these are in balanced state then we call this person as healthy if there is kind of disturbance in these four different planes then you can call them diseased so every time throughout the day we are in the flux of disease state but we the problem is that we don't recognize them <laughs> for instance like before lunch you have a disease so after eating a lot again you go into a disease state right so we don't know because you see I mean there is a problem with the hunger center also sometimes people feel that I'm very I mean like too hungry that I need to eat a lot maybe two pizzas at a time but uh, what usually happens is 
there is a very slow signal in that bodily constituent which gives the response to the, your hunger center that now your stomach is full. So, I mean like those things we just make our diagnose through pulse usually. So, I mean seeing pulse in the modern, I mean like uh, uh, diagnostic tools, you can do MRI or X-ray throughout the day. But for a very clear or standard kind of a diagnosis, we read pulse in the morning. So that is, I mean, there is a whole concept or philosophy behind why it is right in the morning. And you can see these plants, I mean, very rare plants. And in India, they call this Brahma Kamal, Brahma's lotus. And it looks beautiful, very huge, but they are very poisonous. So, Guchi is the main text, which evolved around 10th century. With the help of those integrations of different systems, Guchi means four different TTs. So, in that, I mean, from the very first chapter, I mean, it, uh, it, it has like 156 chapters with like uh, everything is in verse form, poetic, and like more than 1,000 stanzas. And uh, for a physician, you have to memorize those things, and Tony is going through that <laughs> right now. Anyway, but uh, in this, I mean, uh, stanza, one of the stanzas says that body is formed from five cosmophysical elements, CPE, and the illness to be cured is created by the five CPE. Medicine, too, has the nature of C 5 CP, thus body, disease, and medicines are of similar nature. So, this clearly shows that there is a disbalance or flux or random, I mean, kind of a theory going into the whole system itself. So, the idea behind is you have to balance those things from moment to moment. And now the question is why we have body? Why not we can be, we can have an ethereal body, <laughs> kind of ether body, or why there is the development of body? Why aging, disease, death? Why these life processes are there? So all these are dealt from, I mean like the six chapters. How do we get conceived during the fertilization? How do we? At the microscopic level, you can find some physical entity coming up like ova and sperm. But there is another entity called as consciousness, how it comes into play. And after the birth, there are many people who can just remember before the conception, where they are, all those things, when they begin to talk. I mean. And uh, I mean, so relating to this, all the causes are related with ignorance, subtly ignorance. Ignorance not the thing that we used to say like, I ignore him or that thing, but it has to do with the ignorance at a very subtle level. And which gives rise to these three mental poisons like anger, attachment, delusion, all these defilements. So this is again part of what the actual cause of why we have this body. And then the second thing is the law of causality, cause and effect. In Newton's second law, you say that every action has similar or opposite reaction. So it's more or less like cause and effect thing that we talk about. And the theory of dependent co-origination. We don't believe in like a supreme creator or I mean the supreme divine or power which can, uh, which created us anything disease or something bad happens, we don't, I mean, blame others. It is the self. Maybe that is just due to your bad eating habits that I got this disease. This is what, I mean, we say this. So behind this dependent co-origination, there's a whole, I mean, again, concepts. There are many, I mean, like uh, controversies with other schools of medi um, medicines and uh, the primary thing is non-existence of self or I-ness. So just to reduce that thing, I used to, in my mail also, I used to use this 
I in small letter, <laughs> lowercase. And here you can see rhododendrons, part of flower, uh, more high altitude rhododendrons, which are very good for the, I mean, bones, musculatures, because this this is just part of rejuvenative therapy. Anti-aging properties are associated with this plant. So there are more than like 200 different kinds of rhododendrons, and some has got a very good aroma, some are quite poisonous, and especially while those people who cultivate uh, honeys during those periods, then they have to be very careful about the honey itself, because in honey also we detoxify. And I don't know about what the modern factories or companies they do about this. So there is a whole set of detoxification using some other herbs or organic material to detoxify the, uh, because some of the pollens or those have some toxic agents. So we say that, I mean, the bees, even though they can digest those things, but they cannot digest the toxic materials involved in those things. So this is again what, about, what is all about this. And uh, the second thing is about the 5CP in macrocosm and microcosm. In modern, you might have noticed this in most of the chemistry, this shape, ribose. It's like a building block of what our body is. The same thing happens, I mean, I've used different colors, earth, water, fire, air, and space. So at physical level, mental level, and then uh, like emotional level, four different levels. And inside that, even I've used like four different planes, and this is the main, what if there is a self. And if you, make it smaller, then it is more or less like a spherical orbitals of electron is. The dumbbell shape and those things, you might have heard about those in chemistry. So if you, I mean, minimize this, thing, because I've taken this picture from ChemDraw, chemistry. <laughs> okay. And at the macrocosm, microcosm, these things are involved. And this is the golden triangle that we used to say like three humor theory. Maybe this could be associated, I mean, uh, uh, traced back to the greco arabic tradition and to the Indian system because they also accept about the three dosh system. Three dosh in the sense, three humor. But uh, dosh in the sense, it's like mistake, right? And chiyal lung, tiba pekin. All these are quite interrelated. And even at the cellular level or more bigger tissue levels also, you can talk about how they work. And each of these, I mean, uh, entities or physiological processes has, is associated with certain characteristics. So you g cannot go beyond that. For instance, lung is more or less like a space. Even the thing that I talk about, I mean, like talking, moving, movement, everything has to do with the lung and levitating in, I mean, for realization also, this is very important, I mean, lung itself. And Tiba has to do with the heat, metabolism. Pagan has to do with the sustenance, sustenance of the body itself. So it's more or less like a connective tissue. Connective tissue is to do with the Pagan. Okay, I'll quickly go into this. And also you might have come across this shape, benzene. But uh, in our case, what we use, I mean, especially in pharmacological thing, uh, there are various ways of uh, compounding uh, the medicines, or be it herbal, be it anything, I mean, like organic thing. But we use six different teas. So here you can say that, see that this is sweet, salt, sour, all this has to be in series like this, as it is. And inside this, you can see three different, I mean, like uh, teas again. Those are post-digestive teas. So ultimately, whatever you eat in the bloodstream or mainly at the cellular level, these three teas are the ultimate teas. 
that you can find in the body system. So some of the plants are compounded on the basis of six days. Some of the compound or preparations are uh, based on three post-digestive days. So it's more or less like a holistic approach. And you don't have to go into all the reaction thing, spending a lot of things. And the evolution of plant use. Now we'll focus more on the botany itself. Perhaps you might have uh, just got a very little idea about how Tibetan medicine is like. So here, evolution of plant use. How and why Tibetan use this is, this knowledge is uh, acquired through trial and error experiences of cooking, through cooking, fermentation, dairy products, organic products, meat and all those things. Because uh, before like, I mean, 15th century, Tibet is more or less like a nomadic area. So they are whole, I mean, solely dependent on animal products like uh, milk, cheese, all those things, and yogurt and all that. And uh, through dreams also, they have learned a lot. For instance, <coughs> this benzene ring was also, the idea came up from the dream, right? Same thing happens in Tibetan medicine. There are many things which comes into your dreams because there's a whole, again, chapter about how dream comes about, how true they are, do they have meaning, do they have any other interpretations? Yes, they do have. And what exactly it means when sometimes you are in the toilet or restroom and comes back in a different area, what does that mean? Like, I mean, those things are, are quite, I mean, in detail you can see that. And especially with the doctors, it uh, tells you a lot about the patients. And some of the doctors, what they do is if they have like lot many patients from the morning he just prepares all the I mean medicines for each patient before coming so how do they know this like I mean through dream use of dream in the sense because half of our life we go into sleep so they have this I mean uh, area where they make very good use of your sleeping also because sleeping in the sense, you, your body needs rest, not the consciousness. So consciousness, you can again work at other levels. So there are many things. And trance also. Trance in the sense, I mean, not taking hallucinating substances and going into trance, but through other mediums. And through them also, you get a lot of, I mean, uh, use of plants. And there are various sets of pharmacopias coming from those trance also and some of the realizations and clairvoyance. Because when we are talking about the use of medicines through post-digestive taste, that has to do with the use of clairvoyance or realization of very high state realization. Then they, what they do is they study or they just come to know about the whole, I mean like status of what that plant is. Otherwise you might have you might know that uh, there are some, if uh, there are some people who used to say that Tibetan medicine is more or less like Ayurveda, the Indian medicine. But when you go into the pharmacopoeia, then you can differentiate how different they are. Because the plant used in those things are totally more or less like the, those plants which are found in the high altitude or cold desert areas. And then the at the worldly levels, we can say that Tibet has fought a lot throughout the centuries with neighboring countries. So from fights, battles, and war, surgery has come up, actually. Fractures, wound healing, wound management, and then sick people, obviously, because some of the sick people didn't know much about the medicines in Tibetan medicine. They know which will help them which helps them, which is more harmful to them. So this is another, again, the indicator which shows the evolution of plant use sometimes, and accidental also. Now the last thing is observation of birds and plant animals. So
So this is quite interesting. I mean, like, uh, oh, well, so I, I will deal with the use of plant, I mean, observation of birds and animals later, okay? So where plants are used and their interrelation with our life. So in Tibetan, I mean, tradition itself or in the community where they are used, right from the birth, maybe during the conception, after the conception of fertilization occurs, then there is a whole series of things going on. And the mothers then prepares to prepares for embryo also, eating things and all those things. But just taking after the love, I mean birth itself, I'm just talking about. So right from the birth, these uh, preventive measures, growth enhancement plants that are used, and some dairy products especially. And uh, because uh, we say that when we are born into this world, our body is totally fresh and new to all the external environment. So you need to acclimatize, get adapted with the external environment. For that matter, there are certain plants which fills up this gap. So in a way, it's more or less like fighting with the allergies. Right. And then like uh, during the lifetime, medicine or food has got no difference. Unless you are sick, then it's medicine. Otherwise, the food that we take, in our case, we used to say that I'm taking the food or the meal not as a food itself. I'm taking this as a, to sustain my body okay, for the living. So that means it's more or less like medicine. Medicine in, in Tibetan is like men. Men in the sense of benefit or health. So it is just a helper to sustain your body. Food and beverages when healthy and yes, and during the death also, the use of these things are there. And for, let me take uh, one by one by like spiritual realization, you need various kinds of plants because there are certain plants which are very effective for the realization of your own, I mean like uh, different consciousness, I mean stages of consciousness. And uh, because for that realization, you need to, I mean like, uh, clear your channels. When there is a hole clear in the traffic, trafficking of <laughs> these three humors, then there is a whole realization coming up. So for that also, plants are used. And sometimes offering to, I mean, to get yourself or uh, excel into that world, you need the help of others also, not the humanly help, some other help help, I mean non-human, any, anything, so take their help as a friend. But for them, you need certain edibles or anything, gifts. So for that also, they just offer these things, and arms to lower beings. So, so and, and for specific accomplishment of various things, specific accomplishment in the sense, accomplishing clairvoyance, all those things. And uh, in the academic, in the medicine, you can see that use of plant is extensive. In the astrology, biodynamics. You might have heard about this word, but uh, like cultivation of plants in relation with the uh, movement of plant, pa planets and the zodiac signs, all those things, which has got a lot many effects on the plants. So this, is, this has to do with the astrology. Even like uh, we cannot cultivate a plant today, pluck it, use it. No. Because sometimes the day would fell in such a way that they will, the plant will have a negative effect on the patient. So this dealt through astrology. Art and sculpture, they use a lot. For instance, for canvas and all those things, polishing and vegetable dyes, all those things are in use in art and sculpture. And especially in the housing also, domestic purpose. And in the literatures, poetry and all that, you can find lots of, I mean, different plants of Tibetan medicine, how, well, what their qualities and uh, beauties lies, aesthetic lies in those plants. And there are some dramas or didactic uh, about the different plants, I mean, which, which claims their own potencies to other plants. So there is a whole dialogue between the plants also. 
in music also, metallurgy, domestic use, beauty and cosmesis. Beauty and cosmesis in the skin, black hair, all those things are also there. And anti-aging is in the cosmesis. So use of plants, because I don't have to deal with astrology, art, literature, music. I'm skipping all those things. But you can see that in the medicine, when you learn medicines, nowadays you have like the flow chart and you can just memorize all those things. But in Tibetan medicine, you have to learn through this allegorical free use of these things. So like each chapter has got root, trunk, branches, then the leaves, different colors. So when you give the test, it's not that you write everything. So you will be given a set of leaves. You will be given uh, branches also, different colors. So when you speak, I mean, when you recite those, I mean, stanzas, each time you have to build a whole tree. So if you are left with one more leaves in your hand, <laughs> you have failed. <laughs> so this is how, I mean, like, the topics, subtopics of the medicine is dealt or taught in Tibetan medicine. So this thing you can even draw on the earth sometimes. Even, so it's very easy to learn. I mean, nowadays you have like iPad, everything. <laughs> <laughs> so use of plants in Tibetan medicine. The classic says that actually nothing in this world is medicine, given that one knows their properties profoundly. So anything that you see around yourself is medicine. But you have to know their properties, how to treat them, process them. This is, the, I mean, a very holistic concept about what uh, medicine is. So here you can see, I mean, like, group of different rhododendrons. And apart from those, I mean, use of med plants in medicine, I'll talk about some of the uh, plants which got evolved from observation of birds and animals. So here, it's like a primitive man. So some people, I mean, used to say like in the West, Yeti or something like that. So we have this word in medicine also. The theory of Chejo, it's like anti-clotting, uh, anti-inflammatory, many of those things to do with the wound healing, bone fractures. Those are actually learned from the animals and the birds. So for instance, from the pig, black snake, wild primates actually, yetis are, in uh, other literatures you can find the, I mean, uh, the instances of this, what yeti is. Uh, not necessarily it should be like a very huge snowman, but they are more or less like a uh, borderline between the humans or primates. So here you can say that see that I mean some of the plants which are actually learned from these mammals, some from I mean bears also. So these physicians have I mean throughout the history I mean you can find that they have observed a lot from the animals. For instance, birds what they do is. They just crack the egg of a bird, and then afterwards they just observe it. So what they do is the mother bird, she collects some plants, chew them, then apply it on, make it a paste and apply it on the broken shell. And after some days, the, those physicians have found out that those cracks were resealed. So from the, those plants, bone. I mean, like uh, healing and all those were actually learned from those birds and from mammoths and those bears, these crows, choga, and there are like more than 20 different chejos from animals and uh, birds, from fish also. <clears throat> this is a very big fish from <laughs> Huangho River, Yellow River, Sangpo, which goes runs from Tibet, uh, Lhasa, so f and from must deer, deer also, from all because 
they have also got a very specific property about the night vision, nocturnal. So that's why, and from monkey also, the use of anti-poison things. Anti-poison <coughs> plants from the monkeys, and from these, because they can even digest a whole bone. This is a fact, I mean, they are very huge, so how do they do this? So th this also has been observed from the vultures and from tigress about the bone and all that. Not that we are using them, but the thing that they use, the plants and the different things, anti-poisoning, anti-inflammatory and all that. So properties of plants, I told you about this uh, br brief, depending on the taste, potencies, post-digestive transformation, and the uh, very, I mean like abstract thing is about the dependent properties. Dependent properties has to do with, for, for instance, there are certain plants which has like no connection with the taste of its plant with, with the disease where we are using this. But they, in that case, what we explain is the dependent properties, which is the hidden properties behind that, beyond post-digestive taste also. And depending on the color also, some plants, depending on the color, we use them. Sometimes on the shape, for instance, there are kidney beans for kidney. So like that, I mean, for specific organs, strawberries for heart sometimes, wild strawberries, you might have noticed that. And individual power, in the sense, the, uh, the potencies of the power of the parts of the plant itself. Sometimes the leaf, tip of a leaf, Sometimes the root itself, the tuberous ones, might have the uh, most power. And the compounded drugs, they will have, again, a different potencies. And aspiration power. Because uh, when I talked about the observation of plants and uh, animals' behavior, there is also they have, there is the observation of aspiration power. Because some of, the, some of these yogis or when they do extensive, I mean, like uh, meditation and all that, there are some very new species uh, coming up around their retreat centers. So there is no answers to this, but when you use them, it goes, I mean, in most of the ailments or diseases. So that's why, I mean, like observation of those plants from human behavior. So the path that we use in the Tibetan medicine is the root, stem, bark, branches, leaves, fruits, seeds, sap, latex, because in each of these use of these parts, we have to detoxify, treat them also. And uh, there's a whole standard behind how to use these also. Cultivation itself, drying procedures. And do I have to dry it under the sun, or maybe under the fan, or some cool breeze, or just on the furnace? There's a whole, I mean, like different standards for those things, fruits, and use of seeds also, because seeds is very potent. And the outer shell is like, more or less like a poison, again, if you use extensively in medicine. So uh, those things, sap and latex, because the most problematic thing about the detoxification is with the latex or the sap, because it's almost like a very st sticky substance, and it's very hard. We don't use solvents to separate those things. So uh, in our case, the worst thing is about the latex. And the whole plants also used. Uh, so different ways of using plants is sometimes we use single polyherbal and sometimes herb with minerals, with herb with metals also. Metal in the sense, mercury sulfide, lead, all those things. Two minutes, OK, sorry. So when are they cultivated, spring times, all these are has to do with the astrology. So what is the shelf life of a plant? I mean, anything prepared from plant. That's the Tibetan pharmacopoeia says that it is 12 months. Okay, so after 12 months, we have to discard all the things. But here in the publics, you can find 12 for three years or four years. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so in what ways plants are used is like powder, decoction pill, all those things, topical use also. 
and but the poisonous plants needs to be detoxified. So in direct use, in the direct use and indirect use. Directly we can use it, them as in pill form and all those things. Indirectly for metal detoxification, mineral detoxification plants are also used, precious stone, semi-precious. And for some, some of these poisonous plants, you again, you need some kind of a fermented things, plant fermented. And they have like for uses, again for acute and chronic diseases, starting from flu, simple flu, to viral flu, all those flus, cold, cough, and infection, infectious disease also. We deal with those also. And neuromuscular, cardiovascular diseases, pediatric diseases, gynecological problem, everything. Because there is a systematic uh, disease management to all, I mean, all the uh, prevailing diseases in those times. I mean, even nowadays also, they are quite relevant, very relevant. And uh, if you come across some of the pharmacopias, then they will, you will understand about how they are used against. And so far, in my own experience, I've found out like more than 300 different pharmacopias manuscripts, and which uh, adds up to like more than 3,000 different formulations of plants. Okay. And uh, in that text, the Gucci, you will find that more use of more than 900 different plants. And uh, yeah, pharmacopoeia, general, but there is another sacred pharmacopoeia, potentiation of drugs. So you can just make a potentiation in the sense 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times. So it's like a angstrom to pico, molar, 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 molar. So some of the common that you use here, dandelion, and this plant, you might have noticed it. Yeah, I mean, dandelion and viola biflora. This is good for like uh, hypertension also. The root is good for liver, intestine, and fever also. And uh, you can use this as a vegetable also, sometimes salad. And for the sap is used for like wound healing. And viola biflora, this one is like uh, good for uh, wound healing itself, wound management. Juniper for like anti-aging properties associated with this. And there are many, I mean, yogis who just sustain their life just on the fruits of this juniper. And there are some high altitude junipers. This is what I mean. And pines, very huge in number here. Very good for intestine, lifelong. And Fragaria nubicola, this is the wild one, which is like a vasodilator, good for hypertension, good for some macrophages, wound healing also, bitter melon, very good for like liver, intestine, fever. And this is for like diabetic. You can use this as a juice. And, uh, but this is the best one, I think. The rest of them are, I think, modified lately. Barberis aristata, good for eyes. If you use them like eye drop, it's like eye twining. Coriander sativum, good for your stomach. These are some of the, I mean, coriander that you found, find in the, okay, groceries and all that. But still then, I mean, you can use them like in the morning, five grams each day, good for you, I mean, like. But if you take too much of this, you will lose your appetite. Bitter melon also, same thing. Bitter melon is good for your skin also, right? Because I've seen like here, most people have like uh, skin problems sometimes, rash, allergies and all that. So skin for that, bitter. This is good for kidney. Elitaria cardamom. And meristica fragrance, this is good for depression. And you can use, but there is a toxicity associated with this. Don't use this as a single herb because it has to do with, sometimes you can use this with oil or just with butter and then use it externally. And there are certain points where you can use them. Very depressive people, very, I mean like, uh, Weak people, you can use them. This is good for digestion, metabolism. And uh, it looks like, depending on the shape itself, you can just see that, notice that 
it is more or less like a stomach. Okay, rhubarb. But uh, not the leaves or leaf stalk part. The root part is very good. It's very bitter, good for intestine, GIT problems, spleen, liver, pancreas, everything. It works good. But the thing that you see around here, I don't know, because the roots are quite small. The one that we see in the Himalayas or the high altitude area, the stalks are very small, but the roots are really very big. And this person, Malerupa, you might have heard about him, one of the San Francisco of Tibet. And he survived his life on this nettle. And uh, nettle is very good against tumors, cancers, and all that. And good for life also. Those who have a very intensive and those lives, you can use them. So this is the last part of my. Um, but for using nettles, use always the fresh leaves. You can use them as, a, I mean, like porridge. OK, thank you. Any questions, please? No. <laughs> 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 <laughs>